Hi, welcome to Polly Want and Answer, Merck <laughs> Veterinary Manual's first veterinary first Facebook Live episode. I'm Dr. Lori Hess. Uh, I'm an avian and exotic animal veterinarian and a contributing author to the Merck Veterinary Manual. And this is Jody. Hi, guys. And we're here today because we're going to have a lot of fun with these birds. In a few minutes, we're going to start a great quiz to test your knowledge of exotic birds. Um, but first, we're going to tell you a little bit about our backgrounds. As I said, my name is Dr. Lori Hess. I'm a bird and exotic animal veterinarian. I've been one for 25 years. <laughs> Ricky's a little excited. Um, he's so excited to be here. Um, and I'm also the owner of the Veterinary Center for Birds and Exotics, an all bird and exotic animal hospital in Westchester County, New York. I'm also director of of pet health and nutrition at the exotic pet food company Zupreme and I'm here with Jody. Hi guys I'm Jody. I'm a licensed veterinary technician. Um, I've been working for Lori for the last couple of years and we've got two great birds for you guys today. This funny guy right here is Ricky. Uh, Ricky's a white belly kayak. He's a little one too. He's about a year and a half old. Um, hopefully in a couple of minutes he'll be doing some tricks for us. And over here we have Tony, uh, Toby, uh, and she is a dusky conure. Yeah. So they have different personalities and they're going to show you a little bit about who they are in a bit. But we're going to start with our quiz. Um, the way the quiz is going to work is that I'm going to read the question. Um, it's all about exotic birds to test your knowledge. And then I'm going to read some answers and we're going to give you time to see what your knowledge is. You're going to leave your, your answers in the comments. Um, we're going to chat with you a little bit and then we'll see who gets what right. Okay, so we're on to the quiz. Um, after the quiz is over, we're going to see what these guys are going to do for us. They're going to have a lot of fun, do some tricks hopefully. Um, um, then we are going to move on and to a Q&A session where you're going to get a chance to ask questions that maybe we haven't gotten to about exotic birds. Um, and then finally, one lucky participant who answered all the questions correctly will get a free Merck Veterinary Manual. So are we ready? We're ready to start the quiz? I think we are. Let's go. Okay, our first question um, is really, really important, and it's about diet. Um, birds have traditionally been fed all seed diets, high in fat um, and high in uh, energy, and we know that, that those diets can predispose them to heart disease, strokes, and what is the answer? The question is, what predisposes to uh, heart disease and strokes? Is it because these diets are very high in fat? A, is it B, that they're too high in sodium? Or is it C, that they're too low in magnesium? So let's see what you think. We know that birds' Good diets one. are really critical, right, Jody? Yep, very critical to their health. That's mostly what Dr. Hess and I do, is teaching people and educating people about diets. Um, and these pelleted diets, we have an example here um, that Ricky was just chowing down before, um, should consist about 70 to 80 percent, two-thirds of the diet, and then the other third can be, you know, fresh fruits, veggies, other little treats like that. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, you know, <laughs> seeds have been fed all along too long, and Ricky is just so excited to be here. Jody, I think you have to grab him. Um, but uh, there are lots of different kinds of pellets out there. You can see this is one brand. This is Supreme. They come in different uh, colors and shapes. Um, different birds have different preferences, so we all have to see what they like best. But, you know, you really are what you eat, and birds are what they eat as well. So it's very, very important to make sure that birds are on a good diet, which right now we believe to be pelleted diets. So um, let's see what you all thought. So the correct answer is A, they're too high in fat. And it looks like Michelle and Kristen actually got that right. So we're really excited. That's really, really important if you're going to have a bird to know what to feed them to keep them healthy and happy. Um, we know that seeds and nuts are super high in fat. Um, they predispose birds just the way they predispose us to having all kinds of problems because all that fat accumulates in our bloodstream as cholesterol. We get high cholesterol deposits in our arteries. Same happens with these guys. You know, some birds live 20, 30, 40, even 50 years, just like people. And having all that cholesterol, all that atherosclerosis, as it's called in the arteries, it can actually predispose to stroke and heart disease, all kinds of illnesses that we can prevent if we just feed them a pelleted diet that's more balanced, that has all the nutrients that they need, all the vitamins and the minerals that they need to live happy, healthy, long lives. Um, and seeds should really just be, you know. Yeah, like, Ricky here really loves almonds, and that's yeah. fine as a treat, just like if Treats. you or I want ice cream or potato chips right. every once in a while. Same with Ricky and his almonds. Yeah, so save those, save those treats for uh, training and other things, special occasions. Yes. Okay, so we're going to go on to our second question now, um, which has to do with flying, obviously something that birds are very unique to. Um, birds are well adapted to flying because they, A, have higher body temperatures than mammals, B, have lower oxygen requirements than mammals, or C, have pneumatic bones. This is a little bit of a tougher question, right, yes, Jody? this is a good one. 
Okay, let's see what we came up with. Well, we know that birds have uh, a very unique respiratory tract that's very, very different from mammals. Um, birds have lungs, just the way we do, but our lungs move in and out like a bellows um, to pump air through their system, uh, our systems. But uh, birds are different because their lungs are actually fixed um, and they actually have to move their chest to pump the air. They also have these things called air sacs, which look like little sort of plastic or cellophane bags underneath their skin. Um, it's all part of this very unique respiratory tract, um, which is really important because if they're going to fly, they have to breathe very efficiently. Which is important when holding birds, too. You never, uh, birds only have one body cavity. They don't have a diaphragm like you or I separating the two. So when you hold them, you never want to inhibit their chest from rising and falling. And that's yeah, we don't want to put any pressure on a bird's chest no so that they pressure. can move their lungs. So the correct answer here, this is a tough question, was C, they have pneumatic bones. And it looks like Morgan and Emily and Katie actually all got that right. So that's amazing. I'm so glad. I'm surprised so many people yeah. got that right. Okay. That's a really hard question. Okay, so we know a little bit more about respiratory tract, and um, we know that while it's really, their respiratory tract is very different and unique, um, and it's adapted to flying, um, there are pluses and minuses because those air sacs uh, that extend into the bones, which is actually what pneumatic bones mean, the air sacs, those little cellophane bags, actually extend into the bones of the wing and of the leg. It, they actually make the bones lighter for them to fly, so that's a plus. The minus side is unfortunately that because the respiratory tract is so closely associated with bone in birds, when they get infections of the respiratory tract, it can easily spread into their bones. So they have a unique anatomy, which you know has benefits and unfortunately some minuses too. Okay, we're going to go on to our next question now, um, which has to do with egg laying. Um, and uh, we're really, really excited. Oh, it looks like uh, my good friend Danielle D'Amato out there mm -hmm. says hello. Danielle used to work with us. Hi, Danielle. Glad you're watching. Great to see you, hopefully. Um, we're going to go on to our next question, uh, which has to do with egg laying. And egg laying is critical in birds and very, very unique to birds in general. It's something that we deal with every day in our animal hospital. Um, and an important question about egg laying. Female birds often lay eggs. One factor critical to their laying eggs with a hard shell is their access to A, ultraviolet, B, light, B, mirrors, or C, mates. It's a little bit of a trick question, mm -hmm. right? And we see egg laying birds every day. A little cockatiel can lay 35 eggs in a row. Yeah, and they, bir these birds can lay eggs every 48 hours. So you can imagine some people come in and these birds are just laying egg after egg after egg, which, you know, we associate with chickens and chickens can lay eggs and that's really mm -hmm. beneficial to us. But, you know, it's kind of surprising when you wake up and sometimes you don't even know the sex of your bird and mm -hmm. suddenly there's an egg in the cage and you're surprised because you thought it was a boy and now it's a girl. Mm -hmm. and, and the egg laying takes a lot of different vitamins and nutrients yeah. So that brings in the pellet diet, and that's super important for these guys as yeah. well, especially if they're egg-laying. Absolutely. Super important that they get all the nutrition mm -hmm. they need to be able to lay those eggs successfully. So let's see if you got the correct answer. The correct answer is A, ultraviolet B, light. And it looks like uh, Hannah got the answer, and so did Miranda. That's great. So you guys actually know more about yeah, birds than we thought. Guys. That's terrific. Okay, so we know that ultraviolet B light is really important because um, it actually helps form vitamin D in the skin. And that's true in women and, and men too, and human beings. It's particularly important in birds because what, by making that vitamin D and by feeding them a, a solid pellet diet, which contains calcium, they can absorb all the calcium from their food and then they can make those strong, solid eggshells that you know can happen so commonly. If they don't get ultraviolet B light, if they're not exposed to UVB, because as you you know, right, Judy, the, the window problem. Yep, our manufactured windows that we have in our houses are actually manufactured to filter out that UV light, so it's important to supplement that inside with a UV light um, 10 to 12 hours a day yeah, for so these guys. If, you're, if your bird is inside, you do have to supplement because it, the vitamin D actually helps them and it helps them absorb the calcium from mm -hmm. the pellets. And if they're indoors, if like if they're in a colder climate during the winter, like here uh, where we, we practice in New York, um, or if you live in a cold climate and your birds can't go outside, you actually actually have to provide them with a UV light inside during the winter time. And remember, you know, there's no substitute for just going outside and getting direct sunlight, um, but you have to remember winter time counts too. Okay, so, and, and if you don't, uh, we should mention that if you don't supplement that UV light, um, your bones can get really brittle, just like ours. Birds' yeah. bones can get brittle, and they get osteoporosis, and it's really something that's totally yes. preventable. 
Okay, we're going to go on to our fourth and final question, um, which has to do with training and how smart birds are. We know that parrots are very, very smart. They're very curious. Um, as you can see. Yes, you can see. They're very active. Um, and just to ensure that they don't become bored, uh, they should always be provided with A, they should be pair bonded with another bird, B, provided with toys for enrichment, or C, allowed to fly outside. So let's see what your knowledge is of how to keep birds enriched. Yeah, and birds are super smart. You know, a lot of people say that they have the mentality of toddlers, and Dr. Hess can attest to that. I can tell you there are times that I thought my birds were actually a little sharper than my children, and they're probably <laughs> watching now, and they're going to be angry at me for saying that. But, um, yeah, birds have actually been, their, their mentality, their uh, level of education when they're young is uh, like having a three-, four-, five-year-old child. So you really do have to provide them with psychological stimulation as well as physical stimulation. Otherwise, unfortunately, they do develop behavioral problems, things like picking their skin, uh, picking their feathers, screaming, all those behavioral things that unfortunately people don't expect when they get a pet parrot. So let's see what you, what you guessed. Um, the correct answer was B, provided with toys for enrichment, which it looks like a lot of people got that right. It looks like awesome. Morgan, Jen, and Hannah got all that right. So awesome, that's great. Guys. So maybe they, those are the people that have birds. Um, I hope so. Yeah, just um, like toddlers, they enjoy TV or radio yeah. when you aren't home. And I know for a fact that I know a lot of birds that love Dora the Explorer and Little Einstein. So yeah, we actually have thing. we have Dora playing quite often in our boarding facility at our job. Yeah, it keeps birds they entertained. They like all the animation, and I definitely think cartoons and a lot of color birds see in color. So it's great for them to um, have some TV on. And I always say, mm -hmm. you know, if you could listen to the radio, radio is great. But if you could have TV and you could have the audio and the visual at the same time, um, that's really terrific for your bird. So that last question is a terrific segue into our next segment um, where, you know, we've talked about toys enriching birds. Another way that you can enrich, enrich your birds' lives is with training. Um, and so we brought our friends here today. Hopefully they're going to show you some simple little tricks. Ricky in particular is pretty well trained here. <laughs> Hopefully he'll perform. So white-bellied kayaks are known for a little hopping that they do. So I'm hoping Ricky is excited enough to do a couple of hops for us. He may be a little nervous because he's out of his environment, but he's not quite sure what to make Get over here sometimes if we get him excited. You can see kayaks are really clowns. They're really, really crazy birds, and you can roll them and turn them upside down, and now, of course, he's a little camera shy for you. Now he's looking but, at me like, what are you expecting me to do? I don't know if he's going to do the hop, but maybe he'll do the roll for you, Jody. Yeah. And then kayaks are also like little acrobats. They like to, to hang, and they'll see them find them swinging in their cage, and they're a lot of fun. So if you are looking for a very handleable bird, this is definitely uh, a type of bird that you should be thinking about. He's a lot of fun, and but his owners have put a lot into him and have really handled him a lot and taught him how to be socialized. Mm -hmm. He also whistles certain songs. He does Take Me Out to the Ball Game, yeah. and he does the Imperial March from Star Wars. But it's, unfortunately, yeah. we don't have that today. But... He can attest to it. It is pretty amazing. Sometimes in our boarding ward, the birds, although they can't see each other, they can talk to each other. And I did come in one night um, where the one bird was making a telephone ringing noise, and the other bird on the other side of the platform was actually answering the phone. And it was kind of eerie because they were having a whole conversation. It was really, really strange. It's very fun. Um, anyway, so we want to go on to our next segment, which is Q&A time. And it's a chance for you to ask questions about birds for us to answer, maybe the things we haven't touched upon. Um, and we'll do our best to give you our, our best knowledgeable answers. Um, the way that it works is that, you know, you think of your question and then you can write it in the comments section um, and we will do our best to give you our best response. So we're going to start first with Michelle and Michelle asks, what type of schooling does it take to become an avian expert? Um, and that's a question actually as an avian expert, as a bird specialist veterinarian, I'm asked that quite a bit. Um, I went to four years of college, four years of veterinary school, so it's very much like medical school for a doctor, just we're doing this for animals. Um, then I did a one-year internship, and then I did a two-year residency, sometimes it's three years, studying avian or bird medicine and surgery. Uh, then I had to write a bunch of papers and uh, to try to sit for my specialty board exam, and then I took my specialty board exam and I passed happily on the first try and then every 10 years I have to recertify that so it's a long haul there's a whole separate track for veterinary technicians yep so for a veterinary technician you go for two years you get an associate's degree and then you have to take a national exam um, and once you pass that exam you become a licensed veterinary technician and just like with nursing school you have opportunities to specialize so for me specifically since I want to do avian and exotic I have to be working with a board specialized uh, doctor for five 
five years and then I myself would have to take another test and go forward from there. And there's a bunch of skill sets I have to do as well and perfect before that Yeah, I mean, bird medicine in particular is perhaps the most challenging type of medicine uh, among small animals just because there are so many different birds. So for my board exams, I had to know everything literally from a finch all the way up to an ostrich. Um, so mm -hmm. we do have some other questions that we wanted to get to. Um, Morgan has a great question, which is what are the most common diseases or problems that we see in birds today? Um, and we could fill an entire hour of Facebook Live just talking about those questions. Happily, a lot of the infectious diseases um, that we used to see in the past, some very serious diseases like cytosine beak and feather disease, which is a viral disease that unfortunately is fatal in birds, we're not seeing that as much. We do see common infections like parrot fever, which is also called psittacosis. Um, it, it is spread bird to bird and it's common in birds that have been, you know, uh, around a lot of other birds in a pet store, for example. Um, and it is something that uh, reminds us that we we really do need to have uh, our pet birds checked annually, right, Jody? I mean, you could comment on that. Yeah, and the husbandry is the biggest thing. I mean, if you don't have a good diet, if you don't have good exercise, um, that's going to really affect your pet. And yeah. I mean, these guys live longer than your dogs and your cats, so it's very important to bring them to the vet every year. And you should bring them to the vet when you first get them, which is actually related to another question we're getting. Olivia has asked, are there certain types of parrots that do well together if you have them both in the same house as pets? Um, a lot of people get one bird and they're kind of addictive because they're really beautiful and they're fun. So if you start with one bird, you may get another bird, and that's fine. And, you know, birds in the wild are very social animals, they're very flock oriented, but unfortunately a lot of birds in our homes, I don't think they think they're birds. I think they think they're people. Um, certainly I know my birds think that they're people. Um, and when you introduce another bird, it can throw that other bird off. You certainly don't want to house them together necessarily. They don't want to necessarily share their space. Um, and and they, you know, you do want to make sure that that new bird, that you, when you bring it in, you quarantine it in a separate room, separate airspace for a month, and have it checked out by a, a veterinarian knowledgeable in birds. Okay, I think we have some other questions. Um, another question comes from Hannah. She's asking, "What do you wish the general practice knew, uh, practicing vet knew more about avian medicine, um, especially about advising potential bird owners?" Um, I think, well, I think, everything yeah. that we spoke about, yeah, definitely, definitely husbandry, knowing specific bird needs for diet, um, you know, enrichment and things at home, definitely. I think, yeah, I think, you know, there are great general practitioners out there, and before I took my board exams, I know I practiced general medicine. There are great resources out there. The Merck Venery Manual, for example, has great information on exotic birds. Um, you know, there are websites. The Association of Avian Veterinarians has great information. There are conferences. Um, that was from Miranda. Uh, I want to acknowledge that was an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are, there are a lot of ways that veterinarians and veterinary technicians, even without specializing in avian medicine and surgery can become knowledge knowledgeable about birds and teach owners how to take better care of their birds, keep them healthy um, over the long run. And the, the key really is keeping up. So it's keeping That's educated, right. going to those conferences, doing the reading, reading the journals, yeah. you know, staying ahead Medicine's of all the changes. Medicine's very dynamic. You know, yeah, everything absolutely. is always changing. That's why we're required to do certain amounts of CE yeah, per year Yeah, continuing well. education, very yeah. important. We have another very question important. from Zach. Um, Zach asks, what's the most common mistake bird owners make um, when caring for their pets. Um, what do you think, Dodie? I think it, again, it all leads back to husbandry. Um, you know, people not knowing. There are still some people that don't know that pellet is definitely the best diet definitely. for birds. And, you know, uh, they've had their bird for 30 years, and 30 years ago it was seed was recommended. Ricky definitely knows that pellet is birth yeah, side. He's, he's pellet. actually making a really big point. You just push the pellet. Pellet. Yeah, it's learning about their husbandry, knowing what you're getting into when you get that exotic bird. Don't mm -hmm. impulse buy. Don't just rush out and get that animal because if you're not knowledgeable about how, you know, what behavior requirements they have, food, housing, all of that stuff, um, unfortunately you may be disappointed and a lot of birds end up in shelters abandoned. Um, and it's unfortunate because everybody's disappointed. The bird doesn't benefit, uh, you don't benefit, maybe you, you know, spent money on the bird or you become very attached to the bird if you've gone to a shelter, which is a great way mm -hmm. to um, adopt a bird. And so the and, idea uh, is find dead ahead of time, right? Yeah, and getting your family on board too. There are a lot of people that get birds and don't realize they might live for 50, 60 oh, yeah. years and then, their, and then their kids may not be bird people and not yeah. really want um, anything to do with the birds. So keeping that in mind as well, how long these guys live as well. 
So we have a question from Hannah, who uh, is actually asking us a kind of hard question. She wants to know uh, fun facts about ostrich medicine. Well, it's been a while since I treated an ostrich. Um, I can tell you that ostriches lay huge eggs. I can tell you I actually visited an ostrich farm um, in, on the island of Curacao once, and I was amazed that you can actually stand on an ostrich egg. It's that hard. It's that strong. Um, and, you know, a uh, kind of interesting anatomical feature about ostriches is that um, most birds poop and pee out of the same vent opening, the little hole. Um, ostriches are a little different in that uh, their anatomy is such that they actually can do that separately. I don't know how important that is kind of an interesting fun fact um, we don't see a lot of ostriches it, you know that was something that I had to know about a long time ago I'm not a zoo vet but I'm sure other zoo veterinarians could comment a little uh, more accurately than I can but if someone brings in a zoo vet we're gonna have to you know break out the books okay? definitely I'll just keep sure. that in mind um, so, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of fun in our practice, and that's one thing to know if you are interested in avian medicine, um, if you're a veterinarian, a veterinary technician, um, it's challenging, it's really fun, we never know what's coming in the door every day, so we do have to keep up on things, and we're constantly learning, it's never boring. Um, you know, people ask a lot, a very important question, Emma is asking, will my bird get along with my dog? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, you can have a bird in the house with, I have six cats, mm -hmm. so I, and I have lots of birds, so you can have cats, dogs, you can have guinea pigs, bunnies. It's always good to yeah. have a backup though, because you know, birds do, as you can see, there are birds with very different personalities. One bird can get along very well with the dog, and then another bird, you know, may not. So always having a backup plan, you know, if it does yeah, think but it, more commonly so, they are yeah. really good with cats and dogs. You just have to keep them separate. You can't yeah. ever trust, you know, cats and dogs are predators and birds are prey. So you may have the friend friendliest cat or dog out there, you know, that just wants to play with the bird and sees the bird as a toy and maybe just as a friend to pick up and carry around. But we know that dogs and cats have sharp teeth. Um, they can inflict harm even inadvertently on, uh, you know, a nice bird just hanging out in their environment. Um, and so we just don't want to trust them. You know, there are a lot of things on the internet you see where a bird is sitting on the back of the dog riding around that looks really cute not recommended, not something we really want to do. Um, you never want to leave them out unsupervised. So while you can hang out with your family, you can have your bird on your perch and your dog in your lap and your cat at your feet or whatever, um, you just want to make sure you're supervising them so that they're not left alone to their own devices uh, where you could have a problem. So um, that's all the time we have today. We want to thank you so much today for tuning in and participating. If you do have more questions about exotic birds that we didn't get to answer, we encourage you to go to uh, the Merck Veterinary Manual's free online version at MerckVetManual.com, or you can download it from your favorite app store. So we hope you had fun today. We did. Thanks, These guys. guys did. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.